Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, don't want to like gin up too much anxiety among our competitors today. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to GW's fifth annual three minute thesis competition. I'm Chad Heap, the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies in the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and I'm joined today by Nicole Davidson, um, the college's manager of doctoral student services who will take over the hosting duties once we get to the individual student presentations. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's event, which is also being live streamed so that family, friends, and others who are unable to attend today in person will be able to participate in today's competition. And yes, spectators do participate. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. For the second year, um, the Columbian College is excited to collaborate with the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences um, on this competition. Today's event features 12 PhD students evenly divided between CCAS and Cs, each of whom will attempt to squeeze several years of dissertation research into a live three-minute presentation. So before we get started today, I have a few announcements. I want to start by thanking all of the CCAS and C's staff members who've helped put this event together. Um, please join me in a round of applause for all of those whose names appear on this slide. I won't attempt to mention them all, but thank you all for your work. <clears throat> Next, please take a moment to silence your phone. Uh, we don't want the arrival of your latest text message to interrupt um, the concentration of our competitors later today. Um, we also ask that you remain seated during each presentation. There will be a short break after each student's presentation while the judges um, complete their tallies and, and scoring. So if you need to get up for any reason, hopefully you can squeeze it in between those three minute presentations. And following the student presentations, we'll give you 15 minutes. Here's the audience participation part to cast your vote for the People's Choice Award and to invite you to partake of some snacks um, in the hallway um, while our judges meet privately to pick the winners of today's event. So now I just want to give you a brief overview of the 3MT competition. Um, and if you want to read this, you don't have to listen to me. Um, but the 3MT was created at Australia's University of Queensland 15 years ago to challenge doctoral students to consolidate their research discoveries into a compelling 180-second oration for a non-specialist audience. That is a benefit to us since we have 12 competitors today. And as the University of Queensland's website reminds us, an 80,000-word PhD thesis would take about nine hours to present orally. Today's participants join thousands of doctoral students around the world who are participating annually in 3MT competitions at over 900 universities and institutions in 85 countries. Um, and the winner of today's competition, or a runner-up if the winner is unavailable, will have the opportunity to compete in the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools Regional 3MT competition and perhaps the National Council of Graduate Schools competition as well. Um, so this, this gives you the summary of what the history of 3MT at GW as well. Our first winner was in political science. I think last year's winner was in chemistry, if memory serves. Um, now to the competition rules. Competitors may employ a single static PowerPoint slide. No additional electronic media are permitted, no sound or video. No props are allowed, including costumes, musical instruments, or lab equipment. Presentations are limited to three minutes. Competitors exceeding three minutes will be disqualified. Um, we even did this when they were pre-recorded 
um, in, in the virtual version we did. Right? We, we had someone who could not bring their recording in under three minutes who got disqualified, I think. Um, presentations must be in spoken word. No raps, poems, or songs, as entertaining as that might be. Um, presentations are considered to have commenced after the introductory slide when a presenter starts speaking. And finally, the, the decision of the judging panel is final and cannot be appealed. Um, so that you'll know where to uh, direct your objections if you disagree with any of today's decisions, let me introduce and simultaneously thank today's judges. Um, we're joined today by Holly Dugan, Associate Professor of English and that department's Director of Graduate Studies in the Columbian College. <clears throat> by Harold Griesheimer, Professor of Physics in the Columbian College, who may have become a perennial fixture here. I mean, Holly did this last year as well, but have you done every single one of them, Harold? That's what I thought. <laughs> um, by Paul Walbeck, Professor of Political Science and the Dean of the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and by Grace Zhang, Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and Associate Dean for Research in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And now for the criteria that our judges will use to assess today's presentations. They'll be judging the presentations on comprehension and content, asking, did the presentation help the audience understand the research? Was the thesis topic and its significance effectively communicated to a non-specialist audience? And they'll also be judging the presentations on engagement and communication asking whether the oration made the audience want to know more. Did the speaker have stage presence, eye contact, and vocal range? Did the speaker maintain a steady pace and a confident stance? <laughs> uh, you may want to keep these criteria in mind when voting for the People's Choice Award or not. Unlike the judging panel, which is bound by these criteria, you can use any idiosyncratic system that you want to devise in picking your own choice for the People's Choice Award, just keep in mind that there are some sizable checks attached to today's prizes. Um, first prize winner today will get a check for $1,000, second prize $750, third prize $500, and the People's Choice winner will also get a $500 cash prize. Um, so now, to get the competition started, let me hand things over to Nicole Davidson. Thank you, Dean Heap. Welcome, everyone. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. So for the folks in the room, you probably have the, today's program that will list um, the first competitor who is actually, um, last name is Rawson, but that person is not able to be here today with us because they, they're sick. So um, our first competitor is my pleasure to introduce, A.J. Cade. A.J. is a doctoral student in the CCS program in history. A.J.'s presentation is entitled, Death or Victory? The Louisiana Native Guards and the Transformation of New Orleans During the American Civil War. AJ? So it is Black History Month. So do any of you know when the first black regiment was formed during the American Civil War? So a few of you are probably thinking to yourselves, it was in 1863 after President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. While others are thinking of sometime in 1862, but neither is correct. The real answer is May 2nd, 1861. The document you see up here is called a Statement of Service, and it summarizes my research. I wrote an unofficial one for the first Louisiana Native Guards. And I could have been an official one in my capacity as a government military historian, but as you can see in the last lineage entry, 
The unit is currently disbanded. Nevertheless, this document right here rewrites every history textbook you've ever read on the Civil War. You see, the Native Guards was a regiment filled with black men from the rank of private up to major. And they were constituted in May 1861. As you can see on the lineage, they were reconstituted in the Union Army in August 1862. And the order that did so made sure that the lineage and designation followed them into the Union. That made them the first black men fighting in the Union Army as well. Demonstrating their impact, the first black major and the only one to see combat for in these regiments. The Native Guards fought in a lot of battles throughout the Gulf. And they were the first black men to fight Confederate soldiers and take Confederate forts. Most importantly, they fought for the black and Creole society of New Orleans, fighting for both political and civil rights throughout the Gulf. By the end of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln spoke of the Native Guards as proof that black men deserved enfranchisement in his final speech. There was an army study on mobilization, and the study concluded there was a Native Guards that laid the foundation for black men serving in the military, and the authors credit them for leading that charge. The Native Guards continued their fight for black equality for many years after Reconstruction, fighting well into the 1900s, and many of their children have continued that fight up until this day. My dissertation, it proves that the Native Guards laid that foundation for every single black soldier, including myself, with my own military service. My research brings their forgotten story back to the forefront of history for the soldiers and their families who sacrificed so much with so many others during the American Civil War. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Our next competitor is Claire Charpentier. Claire is a doctoral student in the CCS program in genomics and bioinformatics. Claire's presentation is entitled, What Lies Beneath? The Hidden Mystery of Neural Tube Defects. Claire? Before your brain is a brain, it starts out as a tube. More specifically, your neural tube. And this neural tube is what will become your brain and your spinal cord. But sometimes this process can go wrong, which leads to neural tube defects. If you look here in the bottom right, there are two main types of neural tube defects. You have anencephaly, which occurs when the neural tube does not properly close in the head. And then you have spina bifida, which occurs when the neural tube does not properly close in the spinal region. This could lead to disability, whereas anencephaly unfortunately leads to death. And these are one of the most common structural birth defects occurring in one in 1,000 live births. So my thesis project is focused on not only just understanding how these defects occur, but more importantly, first understanding how the neural tube is formed. Because believe it or not, we don't fully understand how this process occurs. If you look here to your left, the neural tube formation first begins with a flat sheet of cells called the neural plate in pink. And as development continues, a small groove will begin to form in the middle as the edges start rising up. And they kind of fold back in on themselves, forming what we call neural folds. 
and these folds will continue lifting, lifting, arching right in the middle and fuse together to form your neural tube. Surprisingly, a big component is often missing of textbooks and even diagrams, and that is the mesenchymal cells that are these cells right there underneath the neural plate in red. And these cells are actually central to my thesis. Using a mouse model, I have found that these mesenchymal cells actually move upwards right underneath the neural folds, suggesting that they help push them up. And when the defect occurs, these cells move more, but in a disorganized way. And I've actually found that these cells have a higher level of a molecule called HSP90, which is responsible for this increased movement. I'm also looking at the genetics of this process because this increased HSP90 could be changing something in my cells that is preventing the folds from elevating. So my research is focused on un unlocking this new um, cell type, these mesenchymal cells, and how they may be presenting a new way to look at neural tube defects. These new insights will not only help us understand neural tube formation, but aid in the prevention of neural tube defects, saving lives. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Okay, our next competitor is Elizabeth Gregorio. Elizabeth is a doctoral student in the CS program in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Elizabeth's presentation is entitled, Understanding the Fluid Dynamics of Divers. Elizabeth? themselves into the air and perform complicated acrobatics all before entering the water. Once they enter the water, the last impression they leave for the judges is the splash on the surface. That means that the splash ends up being a really big part of their score. Now, in order to get higher scores, divers have figured out the best to the internet and diving coaches across the country, that somersault is what is the most essential component of performing a rip entry. It's also the reason why no previous rip entry, excuse me, no previous entry body research can explain how this works. I started my PhD by replicating sphere experiments using simulations. And we see when a sphere enters the water, the surface bends and it keeps bending until there's a moment of pinch off. At pinch off, two things happen. A bubble is formed that follows the sphere down and a jet shoots up. Those two things are connected because of Newton's law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that jet is what divers are trying to reduce. Now, 
If we compare that spear entry to a picture of a diver underwater, we can see that a spear is really not capturing the dynamics of the diver. Uh, when the diver does the somersault, they are not only creating a bubble trail, but they're also bending it. So to capture these dynamics, I took a rough outline of a diver and I added a hinge at the hip so it would turn underwater. And I ran experiments and through these, I discovered that a diver model that turns can more than double the size of the bubble created by a diver model that doesn't turn. And the faster that the model turns, the bigger that bubble is. Now, unfortunately, the rod that pushes my divers into the water does uh, mean that we can't look at the jet in the experiment, but I'm writing simulations right now to see how the splash reduces because of the bubble formation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our next competitor is Nate Harris. Nate is a doctoral student in the CCS program in economics. Nate's presentation is entitled, Do Building Height Restrictions Increase or Decrease Welfare in a City? Nate? Building height restrictions exist in cities across the U.S. and cause much controversy and debate. At the center of these debates is the question, do building height restrictions increase or decrease welfare in a city? Now, in order to answer this question, those who are for and against building height restrictions often rely on the same empirical fact, which is that building height restrictions increase housing prices. Economists who often argue against building height restrictions say that this represents an increase or a decrease in the supply of housing. Uh, building height restrictions decrease the supply of housing with little to no added benefit. It's just a cost imposed on society. Urban planners, on the other hand, tend to argue for building height restrictions and say that building height restrictions actually create a neighborhood quality effect. They increase the attractiveness of a city because they provide uh, residents with better access to sunshine, better airflow, and better views overall. Now, my research tries to settle this dispute using two two innovations to the economic literature. The first innovation is to use uh, a new version of an economic, existing economic model to show mathematically that a new variable, a different variable, aggregate land rent, or the total value of all the land in a city, properly captures the welfare effects of building height restrictions and not housing prices. The intuition behind this is that whereas this supply effect and neighborhood quality effect, both of them move in the same direction with housing prices in that they both increase housing prices. They move in opposite directions with land values, allowing us to distinguish whether the cost or the benefit to, to society is greater. Now, this isn't a new theoretical result within the context of certain urban policy, such as uh, pollution policy or transportation policy, but this is a new theoretical result within the context of building height restrictions. 
The next innovation to the economic literature is to actually create a new data set on ag aggregate land values. A data set like this never existed before, or actually in only one previous paper. So what I try to do is using a recent uh, data from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, I'm able to uh, estimate the total land value for 138 cities. The Federal Housing Finance Agency estimates land values at the census tract level, and I sum up all of those census tracts within a particular city in order to estimate the aggregate land value. Now, using the, this new data set, I'm able to test for the first time in the economic literature the relationship between building height restrictions and aggregate land values, which, as I said before, is a good proxy for the welfare effects of building height restrictions. And I show that there's a positive and statistically significant relation between the two. Now, this result doesn't mean that all building height restrictions are beneficial, but on average, building heights have been beneficial for cities. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Our next competitor is Ling Cheng Kong. Ling Cheng is a doctoral student in the Civil and Environmental Engineering program in SEAS. Ling Cheng's presentation is entitled Lithium Extraction from Brines by Integrated Electrochemical Processes. Ling Cheng. Uh, dear judges, audience, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ling Chen Kong. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student uh, in environmental engineering advised by Dr. Shi Tong Liu. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to he here today to introduce my PhD research to all of you. And we develop a uh, chemical free direct lithium extraction technology from geothermal brine. And as we all know, uh, lithium and battery already become ideal power supply for electro uh, electrical devices and electric vehicles. And the estimate demand for lithium in 2040 is around five times of current size. However, the conventional lithium source, like rocks or salt flat, cannot meet the future demand. And also, the lithium hydroxide, the raw material for lithium and battery manufacture, the price already increased 10 times during the past two years. So the whole world urgently, to need, uh, urgent, urgently need to develop unconventional lithium source to meet the future demand. And we found uh, lithium is abandoned in water, especially in brines. And geothermal brine, our target, is one of the unconventional equilithium source. And there are several existing technologies that can extract lithium from brines. Uh, all of these technologies has a huge same disadvantage. They need a lot of toxic chemical, such as acid, during the process. And the waste has to be properly disposed. So, during my PhD, we develop a chemical-free lithium extraction technology, and we use electricity as the only input and no chemical input. And we can directly generate lithium hydroxide as the final product, and no waste disposal during the process. And the electrochemical process we design is based on the ele uh, electro material and a membrane material design. And our process starts with the pretreatment of the geothermal brine by removing the silica, and then lithium is extracted in the second step. And during the third step, uh, lithium hydroxide is produced and with the purity over 99%. And uh, compared with other technologies, our technology has outstanding advantages. 
we, we use the geothermal power electricity, which is very clean and cheap. And we can directly generate battery grid lithium, lithium hydroxide uh, with very high lithium, lithium selectivity. And uh, from our experimental data, we feed in the uh, synthetic geothermal brine, which lithium only takes 0.9% in the influent. And after extraction, we can produce uh, uh, lithium in the affluent is over 92%. And uh, do, uh, do a further purification and a lithium hydroxide production. And uh, finally, we can produce 99% uh, uh, lithium hydroxide. And uh, uh, we're confident that we can promote the exact technology. And recently, we just have a startup to trying to commercialize this technology. And our goal is to make uh, lithium extraction more cost effective and environmental friendly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ling Cheng. Our next competitor is Jacob Medina. Jacob is a doctoral student in the CCS program in cancer biology. Jacob's presentation is entitled Photothermal Therapy of SM1 Melanoma Utilizing Anti-CD137 Coated Prussian Blue Nanoparticles. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Medina and like Nicole said, my thesis is a mouthful. So let's start from the beginning. Cancer is a disease that can affect 100% of the world's population. Cancer is most characterized by the uncontrolled multiplication of cells and the camouflage of those cells from the immune system. It's that camouflage that makes cancer so notoriously difficult to treat. In fact, untreated cancer or unsuccessfully treated cancer can then spread throughout the whole body and become fatal. Today for my work, we're going to be focusing on melanoma. Uh, melanoma is the cancer of the cells in your skin that give it color. My lab's approach to cancer therapy is known as photothermal therapy. What is that? It is the killing of a tumor using a laser and a nanoparticle. Nanoparticles are molecules that are so small that they can fit in the space between cells. Specifically, I work with nanoparticles called Prussian blue nanoparticles. Any fans of Bob Ross's paintings will have heard of that color before. And it turns out that when you shine a laser on Prussian blue, it gets really hot. So we harness that heat to kill tumors. Uh, more importantly, when cells die from heat, they actually release signals that can attract immune cells to that tumor environment. Unfortunately, that doesn't always lead to an immune response that will get rid of all the tumors in your body. So this is where my dissertation work comes in. I coat Prussian blue in these Y-shaped proteins known as antibodies. These antibodies are specifically meant to stimulate the immune cells that arrive to the tumor environment. And so I inject the nanoparticles directly into a tumor, and then we give those nanoparticles and the tumor photothermal therapy. Theoretically, what would then happen is the antibodies would 
activate the immune cells that arrive. And then those immune cells would go and destroy the tumors that have spread all over the body with us only having to treat one tumor. So currently, my lab and myself have tested this in mice that have only one tumor. And we have been able to find that we can achieve a 50% survival rate for those mice when we use our nanoparticles, compared to 10% survival when you treat the mice with uncoated Prussian blue. Furthermore, those mice are actually resistant to any melanoma that we try to reintroduce to them. So our next goal would be to try and test this in mice that are bearing more than one tumor. And we hope that this work can serve as a foundation for the field of cancer biology to treat late stage cancers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, I'd like to introduce our next competitor, who is Ruli Prasetya. Ruli is a doctoral student in the CCS program in economics. Ruli's presentation is entitled Commodity Booms and Busts and Investment Inefficiency. Ruli? More than 100 countries are categorized as commodity exporting countries. In these countries, significant share of their export are based on natural resources. It might be a blessing to be well endowed in natural resources. However, these countries are also at the mercy of world commodity price fluctuations. Unfortunately, in the past two decades, commodity prices have been increasingly volatile. The bust period are often associated with an economic or banking crisis, especially for low income developing countries. It is then very important to understand the channel through which commodity price fluctuation affect economic stability. In this paper, I focus on firms' investment channel. Firms' investment is an important part of the economy, however, however still less explored in existing research. My hypothesis is that commodity price fluctuation could lead to investment inefficiency. For instance, during a boom period, firms might overinvest, and during bust period, firms might underinvest. This over and under investment, together with its financial implication, might affect economic stability. So to this end, I try to answer four questions. The first one, what are the extent of firms' investment inefficiency in a resource-rich country? Second, what is the role of commodity price growth? Third, what are the financial implications? And finally, how commodity price fluctuation affect the investment inefficiency? To answer these questions, I use firm-level data from Indonesia in the past three decades. Indonesia is my hometown, and it relies on commodity export. The result shows the following. The first one, around 20% of investment by resource firms were an overinvestment. The share is larger during boom period compared to bust period, and larger for firms in resource sector compared to non-resource sector. Second, one standard deviation increase in commodity price would increase the likelihood of firms to overinvest by 20%. And third, firms that overinvest the most during boom period will be more likely to have weak financial performance in the subsequent bust period. 
And finally, the effect not only limited to firms in resource sector, but also to service sectors such as in retail or construction sectors. So how does commodity price growth affect investment in efficiency? I found two channels in the data. First one is internal financing. Firms that overinvest have five times more cash compared to firms that underinvest. Second is external financing. Firms that overinvest typically pay lower interest rate compared to firms that underinvest. So this easy financing might facilitate the managers to invest more recklessly. So what do we do about it? I think first we need to monitor firms' investment in efficiency. And second, the government could rein in bank credit growth, especially during the boom period. And finally, to improve the overall corporate governance condition so that the managers uh, make investment decision that is good for the firm's owner. Thank you. Thank you, Ruli. Our next competitor is Parisa Rafi. Parisa is a doctoral student in the CS program in electrical engineering. Parisa's presentation is entitled Information Freshness in Energy Harvesting Based Wireless Sensor Networks. Parisa? Do you know that uh, the wildfire occurred in 2020 in California was one of the most destructive wildfires on record, which caused more than, uh, which caused the destruction of more than five million acres of land, and destroyed more than 10,000 structures and led to more than 30 fatalities. Well. Uh, wildfires will be continuing to occur because of the uh, world climate change that is causing uh, the drier and warmer conditions. One of the most uh, efficient ways that we can control this is to employ a, a number of sensors in forests where these sensors can measure a couple of parameters for us like humidity, uh, temperature and other important parameters that we can uh, use to uh, predict and prevent the wildfires. Uh, as shown in the middle uh, picture, basically uh, we have to manage the connectivity and how these data are collected. And then based on this data, we can predict uh, these wildfires and inform the managers of forests to take preventative measures. But in doing so, there are several, several important uh, challenges. Uh, as shown in here, we have sensors that are of limited capability and power. Uh, these sensors usually have to um, be charged with batteries. And these batteries get their energy from the environment, like from the um, solar or other resources in the environment and we have to measure, manage the connectivity and when to perform the measurement and transmission uh, in these type of sensors. And so this is where my um, research comes to the play. Uh, in my research, uh, I propose very efficient methods uh, to schedule the timing of these sensors uh, where they should perform measurement, 
uh, where they should perform the transmission uh, and how to manage the battery charge of them efficiently. And so I implemented my method uh, and tested them. And in a monitoring center, I measured the information freshness um, of the uh, methods. And then I understood that my method is more efficient than uh, any other methods that it uh, is currently proposed. Uh, which led to uh, fresher data and is the optimal that we can use uh, as of now. And so by implementing this, we can get fresh data and save the forest and environment. Thank you. Thank you, Parisa. Our next competitor is uh, Anastasia Sarmakeva. Anastasia is a doctoral student in a CS program in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Anastasia's presentation is entitled Landslide Simulations to Save Lives. Anastasia. Landslides claim almost 5,000 lives every year. Did you know that? Sounds shocking, right? Only in the US, it causes in excess 1 billion in damages. The majority of these events happens along the, co the coast, where soil, bold, uh, boulders, and rocks often fall into the water. But there is hope. We can use computer simulations. Initially, these predictions weren't good. But today, with using network of computers called supercomputer, we can make accurate forecasts. To make predictions of such a complicated and dangerous process, we need to divide the area where we want to make predictions landscape into small, tiny pieces and solve at least 10 differential equations at each time step. Then I collect the results and solving the same equations for, the sa uh, for new variables and doing that over and over again. So um, with that way, I know how my landslide is moving with, uh, with the velocity of the landslide, at what speed, the area which is going to be covering. I also know if the water level will rise when the <laughs> then the stones and mud will fall into the water. Uh, so to make predictions, I need to solve at least 10 equations at each piece, at each time step. Sounds cumbersome, right? We have in mind that we're solving our equations for landscape. If the flow behaves like a liquid, we can use fluid simulation methods. But uh, it's not just mud flow. If um, if it's the flow includes boulders, stones, rocks, uh, the cells could cover up to half a third of the cell. The density parameter won't be even, so what can we do? We need to think outside of the box. So stones, rocks, boulders remind us granular media. I suggest to use granular media for simulations. In my work, I use cutting-edge methods for 
water simulation, and the best approach using uh, to do granular media movement and interactions. With the help of supercomputer, we can make accurate forecasts by solving huge system of equations, predict this kind of natural disaster, and potentially save many lives. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Our next competitor is Mansi Vadva. Mansi is a doctoral student in the CCS program in public policy and administration. Mansi's presentation is entitled Bridging the Gender Gaps in Labor Markets and in Caregiving Empirical Evidence from Family Leave Programs. Mansi? It is well known that over the last few decades, women's participation in the labor force has increased. It is also equally well known that significant gender gaps continue to persist in the labor market today. This is probably not new information to most of you, you know, outside in the real world. You must have heard of the gender pay gap or the fact that COVID really hurt women's employment in the US or any of these other terms that you see on the slide today. But if you look closely, we find that while women and men exit the university and start off into the labor force, they start off on a relatively equal footing. But what happens along the way? One big event changes a lot of things. As soon as they become a parent, as soon as they have a child, we start to see this big divergence between the trajectories of men and that of women. We start to see the motherhood, pen pen motherhood penalty, which basically means that women who have children earn a lot less than women who do not have children. We also know that the gender division of labor is a norm even now. So mothers end up picking up the slack for caregiving. They carry a larger share of the burden of caregiving within the household. And at the same time, we know that a lot of these women end up reducing their work hours or dropping out of the labor force or you know, switching jobs to a, maybe a less demanding job. What also matters is occupational flexibility. So the amount of flexibility your employer provides you. So for example, a job that requires you to come in twice a week into the office and work long hours into the evening is a little less easy to do or you know, easy to manage with uh, caregiving than something like a job with remote work which lets you choose your hours. All of these factors, all of these factors play a big role in making this a very vulnerable period for new mothers. So what do we do about it? One of the big policy instruments that governments use to support new mothers is the paid family leave, which is the focus of my work in this dissertation. Paid family leave essentially allows mothers and new fathers to take some time off while not losing the wages that they would have gotten otherwise. What I look at is how do women make these decisions about taking time off work or how much time to take off work or how many hours to work in the context of all these complicated features, keeping in mind that the ultimate goal of these policies is to br bridge the gender gaps, not just in the labor markets, but also inside the home in caregiving. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi.
Okay, our second to last competitor is Ryan Welch. Ryan is a doctoral student in the CS program in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Michael's presentation is Ryan's presentation, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ryan's presentation is entitled Linking the Process: Structure and Performance of 3D Printed Thermoelectrical Materials. Ryan. We are currently in a technological revolution for aviation. Driven by ambitious ideas to fly, let's say from here all the way to Australia in just a few hours. Now imagine a future where it will take you longer to get through airport security than it would be to fly halfway around the world. Well, this will only be possible if we can fly five to 10 times the speed of sound. Now flying faster than the speed of sound will generate a significant amount of heat in the aircraft due to friction between the aircraft skin and the surrounding air. So therefore, we need a way to one, control the temperature of critical components, the critical component here being uh, Tom Cruise and all of his fancy gadgets, or we can use that heat to generate electricity and supplement power systems on the aircraft. Thankfully, there's a specific type of energy materials known as thermoelectrics that do just that. They can use electricity to pump heat, so they act as a refrigerator, or they can use heat to generate electricity, much like a solar panel generates electricity from sunlight. So these thermoelectric materials are typically in thermoelectric devices, you know, shown here in between. They're sandwiched in between two flat plates, and the traditional manufacturing process limits that geometry. So you can imagine that this flat plate will not fit onto the curved surface of that aircraft there. So what my thesis focuses on is how we can 3D print those thermoelectric materials in order to obtain the complex geometries needed to integrate them into complex systems such as high-speed aircraft. Uh, so far, I've been able to 3D print a high-temperature thermoelectric material by fusing layers of powder together with a high-powered laser. So by layer by layer, we build up a component. I then take that 3D printed part and I characterize the material structure all the way down to the atomic level so we can understand how that process with the laser affected the material structure. Then that 3D printed part, we also characterize the thermoelectric properties. So we see how much power we can generate with it. And what we found is that even when we use this 3D printed technique, we're still able to generate electricity when we apply heat to one side of our part. And with this 3D printing technique, we can obta obtain these unique geometries to build more complex systems. So it is my hope that this technology of 3D printing for thermoelectrics will not only enable things like faster air travel, uh, but that we can use it to recover waste heat from multiple sources. So waste heat from steam pipes, waste heat from industrial processes, your body heat, Tom Cruise's body heat, we can all use it to generate electricity. Uh, so this is, in fact, a stepping stone to many more new technologies well into our future. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our final competitor is Sarah Yusvi. Sarah is a doctoral student in mechanical and aerospace engineering in SEAS. 
Sarah's presentation is entitled Numerical Investigation of Subcooling Effects on Pool Boiling Heat Transfer Under Earth and Microgravity Conditions Via High Fidelity Simulations. Sarah? This is International Space Station. You may know that in space we have a, a strong radiation from the sun that heats the equipment and we have no air to cool down our equipment. For that reason, we use cooling system. The motivation of my PhD research is how we can improve the design of the cooling system to get better energy efficiency and cost saving design. And one of the solution is to use pool boiling. So what does pool boiling mean? As you can see, pool boiling occurs in your everyday life. For example, when you are cooking pasta, you are heating a container. The heat of this container is transferred to the water, and once the temperature of the water becomes above the saturation temperature, we have a pool boiling situation. So in pool boiling, we have two phases. We have bubbles, that represents the vapor phase, and we have the liquid phase. Pool boiling is a very efficient cooling system because it enables heat removal by a phase transition from liquid to vapor, but it is very complex because instead of studying one single phase, we are studying two phases. You may also know that in space, the gravity is reduced compared to Earth gravity, and we call that microgravity. So microgravity impacts the pool boiling. NASA conducted experimental research on both air gravity and microgravity on pool boiling, but because the experiments on microgravity are very expensive, my research to turns towards numerical simulation. So I found that our numerical solver allows us to reproduce experimental research. You can see here the small black images, They're, they are from experiments, so the numerical simulation match these experiments. In Earth gravity, we have formation and departure of this bubble, and in microgravity, we have big bubbles surrounded by a small satellite bubbles. As I found that our solver matched the experiments, I moved toward investigation, the effects of subcooling on pool boiling. So what does this mean? Subcooling means that you bring your liquid temperature under the normal boiling points. In other words, increasing the subcooling means that you are decreasing the liquid temperature. And we found that the bubbles, we have less departure, and the bubbles will reach a, a point that we have the bubbles that stay attached to the surface and they did not depart. However, they are interacting between each other, which impacts the heat transfer. We also see that it impacts the uh, uh, shape of the swirling fluid. So when the bubble is departed, we have a, a mushroom shape, but when we increase the subcooling, we have a ring shape and later a uh, discontinuity shape. So as I found that our solver allows to reproduce experimental re results, and I investigate the effects of subcooling on pool boiling under Earth gravity, we can then apply these tools to microgravity. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. How about a round of applause for all of our presenters? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we are now going to move to our intermission, our voting intermission. Our judges will be able to leave the room. 
We've got a room set aside for them. Paul will escort our judges. Um, is it room 315 or 310? Oh, okay. If you could follow Paul. And for the uh, live stream audience and for the folks in the room, you will have the opportunity to vote on the People's Choice selection. Uh, you should be able to, you will be able to vote via the link here. Um, we've provided the link as well to the voting, to the audience virtually. And our link, our voting link should open at 410. So that, actually we've opened it. We've opened it. Great. So you can start voting and please, you are welcome to have some beverages and refreshments that are outside in the hallway. We'll be back in approximately 15 minutes. So at about 425 or so. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Help yourself to some water, some drinks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I've rustled the judges up, and they've agreed to come back in the room. And they have some decisions that they're going to hand over. Their secret envelopes. Thank you, Paul. All right. So you made our decisions very difficult. You all did a wonderful job. And <laughs> So just as a reminder um, of the prizes involved, um, so the People's Choice is a $500 prize, the third place is another $500 prize, cash prize, second place is $750, and the first place winner gets 1000 bucks. So with no further ado, do we have anything here to rustle? <laughs> yeah. Our People's Choice winner is... Anastasia Sarmakeva. Our third place is Nate Harris. Our second place is Jacob Medina. Jacob. First place is Ryan Welch. Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, especially to all of our competitors. You were all absolutely amazing. Thank you. And thank you to our audience. And um, thank you to our 3 MTers again. And our, present our workshop, our presentation has come to an end. Um, our live stream can be viewed uh, on the CCS Facebook page, and we'll have links that, um, that will be there. Thank you all once again. <laughs>